we have a very special guest, Assistant Professor of Practice, uh, Construction Management Tech at Purdue University, Mark Zimfer. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. We're looking forward to chat with the, about the little construction and uh, construction education today. And so Mark, if you could just give me a brief intro of who you are and what you do. Absolutely. Um, as you said, I'm a professor of practice. That's a really long uh, word for saying I'm an industry person who's come back to teach. Oh. So I, I grew up in construction, uh, family construction business, land development, um, and residential commercial. Uh, so grew up in that but uh, um, came to Purdue to get a master's degree uh, so I could learn um, maybe how to run a business better, to understand better. I, you know, I, my dad was a great teacher. Uh, he, he, I think he taught us really well, but I, in, the, in the back of my mind, I knew I was only learning one person's technique and, I, and I, there's always another way to do the job. And I, that's why I decided to, to come to Purdue to get a master's degree in construction management, just to see if I could become better at my job. Um, so Great. when I signed into that program, um, they, uh, they had seen some certificate, um, training that I had done, mm -hmm. uh, and asked me to teach some courses at Purdue. So one thing led to another and, uh, and, and that's how I ended up, uh, at Purdue, uh, full time. But the nice thing is, is I, I still get to operate in construction. I still build a, a handful of projects every year so I can stay fresh and, and in the field and make sure I'm teaching the latest and greatest uh, to our students. So uh, it was a pretty natural progression for you uh, in terms of going from construction, construction business to teaching. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I really enjoyed the process uh, and, and I think a lot of good constructors are always in that what can I learn Mm -hmm. to do my job better. So yeah. when I started at Purdue, I was like, okay, what kind of resources do you guys have to make me a better instructor? And Purdue has a lot of internal resources. So it kind of ate that up. I mean, it's similar in construction, right? You want to do your job better. You want to go learn a new technique. And that felt very natural. So an observation that I've had, and, and oftentimes I'll kind of be at odds at the folks that I'm talking with, but my position is that as an industry, Construction tends to be more conservative. It tends to be more uh, resistant to change. Uh, and oftentimes it, it resists the new technology. Uh, therefore, oftentimes construction companies are the last to the table as it relates to technology and innovation and kind of that creativity. Although there are all sorts of starved artists, you know, frustrated artists inside of construction where you see beautiful art. Right. Oh, we love in sessions giving them Legos to play yeah. with or putting a, like a paint marker in their hands yeah. and you get such cool yeah. stuff. Right, but I think, I, I don't even necessarily see that as a bad thing, but I see that as a huge opportunity to move the industry. And you're starting to see that happen more and more. And I think that COVID actually helped move construction more than almost any other invention uh, in, in modern history because now everybody is doing virtual conferencing. Everybody's doing right. file sharing. Uh, and now construction's finally at the table. Uh, so some folks know that I'm, uh, I graduated from Purdue, but I think many people don't know how, how high my opinion is of the school and of the education. And I felt like it, it was a very cost effective degree. Uh, I could do it right. while I worked full time as a project manager, um, but it traveled really well too. So it landed me my first job in Seattle. It landed a job for me yeah. in Toronto working on a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. well, growing up in Indiana, Purdue was just the school which was, was just, in our backyard. It's just and, the school. Yeah, absolutely. And it was yeah. really surprising to us when we realized that people in Seattle were impressed with that sad name. So whether, whether I don't know if you want to start with talking about the innovation that you've led or, or participated in uh, with, with kind of reinvigorating the construction program. Uh, do you want to start there? Does that seem like the right place? Yeah, I'll start there and, and I'll follow up real quick on, on what you said. I didn't realize kind of the reach as well. And then all of a sudden, as you're there, uh, you know, we get students coming from all over the world to study at Purdue. Um, uh, my youngest just started there yesterday. Um, uh, so we, I watched the orientation and I think they said all 50 states and, you know, upwards of, of 80 countries from around the world are on campus right now, which is representatives, which is so cool. Uh, 
but yeah, that reach and that, that uh, where the degree and can take you is pretty amazing. So exciting place to be. Um, but leading into the, to the curriculum change we went in, that, when I came on board five years ago, they had just kind of, uh, the other faculty um, had just come, come out of like a year long, let's rethink how to teach construction. And they were just starting to put the skeleton together about what it may look like in the future. Because I think that conversation was happening, mm -hmm. uh, just as you talked about, are we teaching it the right way? Are we keeping up with where the industry is going or needs to go? And the I, answer was no. Yeah. They thought I, they could I, do it a better way. And I'm connected with somebody on LinkedIn who shared uh, the fact that he was part of that, that group, uh, where basically right. they brought in a bunch of engineers, they brought in a bunch of construction folks and kind of workshopped uh, the type of education that, that you're providing. And I think more people, more companies, more, more uh, uh, construction folks specifically should be taking a pause to reassess look how far the world has moved in five years, right? Right. If we're still using the same practices that our fathers did uh, with regard to technology and, and process, we really need to take a pause and figure out, are we doing what we should be doing? And it sounds like that's exactly the, the process that you went through. That's exactly right. And, and that industry input, I think kind of opening the doors from academics to industry and saying, we're both going for the same thing, right? We have the same goal, so we need to communicate. And Purdue's very fortunate. I believe we have the largest career fair in the country for construction students, uh, 191 companies at our last career fair. But then we have a very strong advisory council, upwards of about 78 companies right now. So we met with that advisory council and said, what, what are we do what, where are we failing? Where, where can we do a better job? with our students so when they come to you, they're better prepared because if we're being honest, those students, it's not like it was 20 years ago where you'd leave a, pr a program like Purdue and you'd get five years or eight years to kind of ramp up your skill set and then be put in charge. Sometimes these students are put in charge of a very key piece of a project six months out of, out of school, a year out of school. So we said, if, if we're gonna put them in that position, we need to do a better job of getting them ready. So an, an interesting part about the work that we do is our, our opinion is that many of the folks who go through public education uh, oftentimes forget that they liked learning. Uh, right. They forget their love for learning. And we have a, a mantra in our company that is, we don't grow up, we just get bigger. Yeah. And the idea behind that is that we understand that kids uh, learn differently. Sometimes they learn better by doing or seeing or hearing or touching or, or laughing. Uh, we get that about kids, but then this weird thing happens that when we turn 18, all of that is out the window. You should be able to watch a webinar. You should be able to read a book and just absorb what it is that I'm telling you. Um, but, but the angle that we take is that it is more important than almost anything else that you're having fun while you're learning, because if you're not having fun, you're not learning. Uh, and, and anyone who's ever been in that class where you're just falling asleep and watching the clock, you are not, you are not gaining anything from being there. And, and I applied that same uh, philosophy to projects that I would run in, in the field, uh, because when my teams are having fun, uh, then they're gonna be engaged, they're gonna be riveted, uh, and they're going to be exhausted at the end of the day in a really good way. So in what ways are you seeing education change uh, for, for Purdue specifically, not even necessarily to implement some sort of gameplay, uh, literally, sure. but, but what kind of creative elements are you seeing come into play uh, with the program? Help keep everyone engaged. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's right, is when you look at how people learn, it, there's multiple facets, right? That, that some like to listen, some like to do, some like to just read. So we have to constantly mix that up. So we try to use as many media as possible and kind of keep everybody on the edge of their seat. Now we know when we're talking about uh, strength of materials, are those calculations really exciting? No. But if we can take it to where they watch the video before class, then they come in and we're going to do some group work uh, on that 
particular calculation. Then we're going to break them out. Uh, maybe we head outside, head down the street, go see a project uh, that's going on Purdue's campus and directly apply that calculation to what we can see with maybe a concrete pour and the rebar and things like that back to the lab, put it together with, with a, a small batch of materials, back up into the classroom, capture some more on video so they can do some follow-up work. I mean, it just constantly, I guess, remixing the concepts, but in different formats so we can catch every learner that we possibly can. Even to the point where we've got videos uh, where the camera is shooting down on an instructor's hands and we're actually doing the calculation on a piece of paper so somebody could freeze the video, go back and say, okay, wait, what was that again? And truly start to understand. You know, we get a lot of um, students in construction that are, um, oh, I don't know. They're the kids who loved Legos. You know, I, I say Lincoln Logs because I'm old enough to remember Lincoln Logs, but they love putting things together and taking them apart those students aren't going to do very well in a pure lecture. So why are we still lecturing, you know, and lots of schools have done this. It's not just Purdue, you know, where you get that active learning going, but it can't be active learning for five minutes out of a two hour class. Yep. It, you know, it has to be more involved, uh, really mix up the parts and pieces. And that's, that's part of what we've done with the new curriculum. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think there's a lot to that, you know, something that we've discovered in our work that makes a huge difference is when you can make it real. So we can teach prints and we can show you some blueprints that we have mm -hmm. and we can all look at them together and everybody can fall asleep in their desks. But when we can have people, you know, once we get people who are in jobs, when we can have them working on their plans for the project that they're mm -hmm. about to be starting, Whenever they can look at those plans and see something in real life, mm -hmm. when they can connect what they're learning with something in real life, that makes such a huge difference. One, one of the most unique offerings that we have out there is something called project coaching, where we take a real project team and we take a real project and we walk ev through every single step of that project together and we coach them through the process and the life cycle of running that project. Uh, and uh, we're not hands off. We get in, we roll up our sleeves, we get right. dirty with them. Uh, it, and it starts from, from prior to signing the contract to the close of the warranty process. And by the time they get through that process, they understand that job. They understand their job better than, than almost any other applied way uh, possible. But I think one of my, my favorite things about Purdue and, and my time there something that made more of an impression on me than anything else uh, was the idea that you have a requirement and you said for internship, but I believe when I was there, uh, I think it was, it was physically spending time in a field position. So I went to West La or, sure. went to uh, North Central um, and there was a, a requirement that you had to work in construction for six months. And I felt like that, that requirement uh, made it so much more real. And I had worked in construction since I was a kid, but many of my peers hadn't. And it was a great experience. They would go work for cement masons and they would go work for uh, placing rebar and carpentry and what have you. Right. And I would say that single detail makes all the difference in the amount of respect that you can receive or, or earn from, from the field that you're managing. Uh, it, it makes a difference of whether or not you should never be able to assign somebody to work on Christmas if you've never worked a Christmas, if you've sure. never worked weekends. And I think that it brings that reality to it. And I, I really, uh, I really appreciate that component from Purdue. Yeah, that that piece of requiring the internships and making sure that they understand the way the industry works, I think is is critical. Um, it, it, it's kind of that binding agent to sync up everything that we've been teaching them in class, but also give them that taste of this is what it's like. We, we have a freshman class called uh, 150, and it's kind of an introduction. It, our new curriculum is a mashup, so you don't, you, they used to take like a uh, plan reading and documentation course as a freshman and an OSHA 110 course and an intro to surveying. Those are all now together in one course. 
So these are big six and nine credit hour blocks. So these massive courses that meet four days a week, lab component, you know, um, classroom time. So you, we look at that. Um, so in that class, they get planned reading. But as soon as they get planned reading on one day and they've watched the video, we do some lecture type active learning thing. The next day they're in lab. And they're taking that plan and we're going on the lab floor and we're building this small house. Yep. Uh, and they're putting on the tool belt and somebody's in charge of this crew and somebody's the project manager for that day. They're doing the documentation and it's just getting them to understand this is what it takes out in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not these buildings and roads magically show up. There's pre-planning, there's paperwork, it's a people business. And if you can't do those things, then the building and the road will never happen, let alone happen well. Right. Uh, and I think a lot of kids come to us thinking, well, um, you know, I'm going to go out and build things. Yes, you will. Mm -hmm. But you better be good at all these other skill sets. You better be good at documentation. You better be good at absorbing material that, that you read or hear or, or see. Uh, and you better be good at, at uh, kind of documenting what you did that day because it's all part of the paper trail for the project and, and making them work on that. Not when they're a senior, not when they're on their internship but that first class that they come into us as freshmen we're going to start right then they're you know why wait let's tear the band-aid off let's get to work right so um one of the the favorite pieces of feedback we've received is it, it was i love the feeling of failing in a controlled environment right i Absolutely. love the feeling of failing in a controlled environment and i feel like that is kind of what you're trying to achieve when when you're teaching a project team when you're, you're teaching anything. Uh, and I think that it communicates the idea that making mistakes is part of it. Uh, making mistakes, that, that is really the best way to learn when you can see the mistakes happen, you can rewind the mistake and figure out uh, how could this play out differently. So, it, and it sounds like you're, you're trying to create that immersive environment where you have sort of simulated projects running from freshman year to, to senior year. Uh, how, how do you find that, that, that uh, submersion into, into that project uh, delivery method or that project teaching method? How is that different from maybe your educational experience or, or other programs that you're aware of? Right. The feedback we've gotten from the, our students, um, this is a pretty good smack in the face, so to speak. They're not used to this style, especially... Uh, as a freshman, because um, it gets pretty intense. We put them under strain in the construction lab. I mean, uh, in our lab, you know, we build two, two wood structures, then we tear them down. Then we build a two-story steel structure with a crane, uh, and they're learning rigging and fall protection and their crane signals. And so it's intense, it's loud, it's active, it's, it's a job site. And so with that intensity does come the mistakes. And that's, you're hundred percent right. We said, look, let's fail here. You know, if we, if we screw up some cuts and we're doing some framing and you're just, you've never done it before, we're learning the basics. It's okay. We tell them that, you know, you paid for the lumber with your tuition money, you know, so it's, it's okay if we screw <laughs> up a few boards, but let's do it right now where the, you know, we're not, we're not, um, we don't have a company's money at risk. We're going to really watch our PPE and make sure our safety protocols are in place. Uh, so let's go ahead and make mistakes and let's make mistakes and then turn around and say, what did I do wrong? What, what, what can I do to help? And with multiple instructors in the room, uh, we can watch like a hawk. It's not just me. If we see somebody starting to do something wrong, we can step them and say, okay, let's think this through a little bit. Is there a better way? And this not as just for the physical aspect, but we're watching whoever the team leader was that day. And we say, you know, go ahead and step back and scan your job site. And yes, it's a lab, but scan your job site. Do we have people standing? Do we have people not sure what to do? Do we have a group that's maybe not paying attention? This is your job as the manager to try to keep the project flowing the right way. Now let's go work on your communication skills and go address each one of those different issues and let's see how you do. Mm -hmm. And then if you 
bungle it, it's okay. That's what we're trying to do. It, I think that letting them know it's okay to fail and it's okay to ask for help. I think a lot of people think, well, I'm supposed to come to a place like Purdue. I'm supposed to learn construction management and I've got all the answers. You don't, you don't even have a thimble full of answers at that point. That's, you a, that's, have our, terminology. Seven, that's our 17 year old daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I watch, um, and it's fun to see that, that transformation where they go, okay, I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to understand that I'm, I, it's not necessary that I know everything at 18, 19, 20 years old that I can ask questions. And I share my experiences. You know, I'll call up the, the local inspector's office and say, look, I'm getting ready to do X, Y, and Z. I need your help. I, I, I wanna run it by you. I need some advice. And they see, well, you know, why would you ask somebody for advice? You're, you're 50 years old and you've run a company for 22 years. Well, yeah, yeah, I have, but that doesn't mean I know everything. Mm -hmm. There's people who, who've got good information and if they'll give it to me for free and all I have to do is ask for help, isn't that a wonderful place to be? So just trying to get them to, under, to, to loosen up a little bit and know that it's okay. There's, there's a, a problem in the industry uh, and and it's something that on every one of my jobs it would become goal number one to solve and that is the division between field workers and office workers mm -hmm. there's yeah. there's oftentimes a perception and this doesn't matter if it's a union shop or open shop or what have you there's often this rift whether it's perceived or sometimes it's physical the separation between the workforce and, and the management force, right? Uh, and, and in many of the things that you're, you're talking about, you're kind of touching on getting these people who will likely go into management more comfortable with safety topics and more comfortable mm -hmm. with rigging or understanding what's involved. Can you share anything about what the program does or, or what you try to do personally to uh, lessen the impact of that rift? Yeah, the, we, we, we start very early, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, we, and we'll get that, you know, those people will say, well, you know, it, Purdue's not a, 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 a trade school, right? So, you know, you're teaching them how to frame a wall. Why? Well, because it helps solidify the, the takeoff that they were working on to solidify the estimate that they were working on, their plan reading skills. All we're doing is taking those steps that we just taught them in the classroom, and then by actually putting the pieces together, they go, oh, now I get why we, you know, add up the studs this way, or we calculate, you know, the lineal feet of rebar in a footer, and so it lets them put their hands on those parts and pieces. So we said, we're not a trade school, but we're trying to solidify that we're also trying to give them an appreciation for, wow, it just took four of my classmates and I an hour to build this wall, and it looks horrible. It looks like Charlie Brown's, you know, Christmas tree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then we take them out to a job site, and they see two, you know, craftspeople framing up a wall, and they frame up a 40-foot wall in that same hour, and it's beautiful. And they, we, we, we want them to understand there's a skill set out there that you have to appreciate. Mm -hmm. We do that. things like uh, we, we lay up concrete block, and we even mix up mortar and things. And it's, oh my gosh, it's like kindergarten. I mean, there's mortar flying around everywhere. It's all <laughs> over their clothes. You know, there's very little in between the block. And again, we get that question, why are you taking the time? Well, if you've never lifted concrete block, even for an hour and felt what it does to your hands and how heavy it is, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good job, but you watch a professional and they make it look so easy. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to feel comfortable. Uh, and I tell them, look, when you're on your job site and you're at an internship and you've got some time to kill, walk the job site mm -hmm. and talk to people, go up and say that, Hey, I learned about that in my class, but you know, just this much, can you share with me what you're doing, how you're doing it, how did you learn to do it? You know, any, any tips or secrets you can give me, that's what we think will help bridge some of the gap. Now, all of a sudden, that person who's got that skill set can turn around and go, okay, this isn't a manager coming to tell me what I'm doing wrong. This person asked, how, how'd you learn how to do that? Well, you know, is there a little secret that you can share with me? And it just, it starts a communication, right? And as long as we talk to each other 
we we learn from each other but you got to get them to talk yeah well, and it's often really surprising to people how quick those people that they ask the quick those questions to are to want to share that knowledge because they don't get Absolutely. to talk about that all the time like many times their kids no. don't care their spouses don't care uh, about about their trade not about the details of, of how no. the, the stuff goes well, together and and so i was a, a residential construction project manager and i moved into mm -hmm. moved to seattle started work as a project engineer for a large scale commercial outfit knew nothing about commercial construction fresh out of purdue and sure. uh, uh, i didn't know anything about my job and and the way that i learned was that every single week i would identify a trade foreman uh, and i would take them out for coffee or breakfast or lunch and i would grill them for 30 minutes straight or whatever they could give to me about everything that they've learned in their 30-year career uh, in the right. trades uh, what can I learn? What should I watch out for? What should I be aware of? What should I never do? And using that process has been uh, transformative in the way that you appreciate other people, the way that you acquire information and kind of put it all together. Yeah, I think it's that communication aspect. You know, I tell freshmen the very first day, if you think you came to our program to learn how to put buildings together, I'm going to disappoint you with these next few statements. You know, there's only so many ways to attach two pieces of lumber together or two pieces of steel together. Once you've learned those techniques, there's not a lot to know about that connection point. But it's how did the material get to the job site? Who's putting it together? Under what circumstances do they have to put together? Are we following the right codes? Are we following the right specs from the architect or engineering firm? It's all of that stuff that you need to learn. And, and that communication piece with all those different, you know, whether it's a vendor, a subcontractor, the owner, uh, A&E, how are you gonna communicate with all those different parties that all have a slightly different definition of success yep. on a job site. And yep. those are the things that we want to work on. You know, I, I, I teach a residential course uh, since that's mainly my background, land development, residential. Um, and we took, uh, it, it's, it's embedded in another course. So it's only 11 weeks, but six of those weeks are them acting as the builder with students that are playing the homeowner Mm -hmm. And the students playing the homeowner have been preloaded with, um, <laughs> with some issues, right? Mm -hmm. But they have to set up the meetings. They have to collect all the information. They have to do some rough plans, some rough estimates. And we try to capture all that because I can sit there and tell you about it. Mm -hmm. But if you have to pull that information from somebody and you have to communicate with them and turn their comments into actual documents that would be needed to do a construction project it really makes the it it makes it uncomfortable it makes it a little more intensive but it gets them to practice on talking to people and listening to people and gathering information and that's i think the best thing we can do for students is teach them that skill yeah absolutely so a, a principle that we we really push about the construction industry is that it is a service business it is a service-based industry. Uh, and, and some of the best comparisons that you can use come from food service. How would you expect to be treated in a nice restaurant? What are the, the roles and the procedures and the protocols for that? Uh, and, and many times we have these misaligned expectations in construction where we have these explosions and we don't really know why. Uh, and I think that, that you had shared previously that, that Purdue is focusing on teaching some of the soft skills or role playing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and why that's important? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've heard a lot about soft skills, but when we talked to our advisory council, they said, you know what, let's generalize a little bit right now. Young students mm -hmm. are not very good at communication, right? They, they don't write very much anymore. Well, they are let's used say they're, to, they're not very good at, at traditional communication. Commute traditional, <laughs> absolutely, right? Short burst of a text message or something like that. And, and we get it, but you can't just say, oh, they're bad at communication. Yeah. Let's take where they do communicate well and let's put them in other situations to help them build their skill set. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's a good public speaker. 
but you can all learn to speak in public better, even if you're not this, you know, born, you know, spokesperson and you can immediately step in front of a microphone or a group and be okay. Not everybody is, is at that, I guess, comfort level. So right. as we started to look at that, and I even use, I've got four, four, uh, four, ch you know, kids of my own, uh, all college age, you know, um, and I watched how they communicated with each other and how they communicated with, with the, my wife and I and said, okay, so what can we do to make our students better at this scenario? And really what it came down to in a lot of cases is they need practice. They haven't been asked to put something in writing very well, other than maybe, hey, we're doing this essay question. Mm -hmm. Well, let's not do that. Let's, let's think about it from construction. Mm -hmm. What if it's an RFI? and you're writing an RFI, how do we make sure that you're really gonna communicate well enough in writing to get the answer you need? So let's work on that. Yeah. Uh, and we get the freshmen right away. I tell you, this, this drives them nuts. They have to fill out a daily report every day. Mm -hmm. And so, because we'll go outside and survey or we're in the construction lab. So they, you know, the normal things you would see, the weather, the date, the times that they worked, were they on a crew? What materials and tools did they use? A description of what they did. Were there any visitors that day? It's pretty detailed. Mm -hmm. And then we've got undergrad TAs, which is great because yeah. these are kids that just went through the course maybe a year before. They help us go through every single word of those daily reports. Yeah. And we look for misspellings. We look for where did they put AM or PM? next to the time slot, mm -hmm. just little tiny things. And we go back and we review those with them to say, okay, we understand what you're trying to say, but you're speaking in shorthand. You're speaking in construction terminology. Let's take this as a worst case scenario. What if this moved into a court of law? Mm -hmm. you, by leaving out that one word, yeah. it's not as clear yeah. as it could have been. So we just those little things, for example, for writing skills, that's where we want to start. But then we try to do some fun things. Yeah. Don't give us a presentation. We don't, you know, you've all did, done presentations in high school. Instead, why don't you guys give us a, it's a material review on, let's say, citing materials. Your team has to do it in a video format. Mm -hmm. You can be as creative as you want to be, and you wouldn't believe the videos we get. It's mm -hmm. um, mockumentaries. Mm -hmm. It's ESPN Sports Center, but it's yeah. all about citing materials. It's a Jeopardy parody. Uh, the kids are incredibly creative. Yeah. They just weren't given a chance to be creative. So yeah. Yeah. working on a communication skill, but in a very odd way, let's put it, you know, by just saying, let's take the barriers off. Let's just go. Well, and that's a great way, I think, to meet them where they are, because that whole conversation of, you know, they're not necessarily trained in that formal communication and they need mm -hmm. to learn it, but giving them the opportunity to communicate in something, making videos, that's something that is more comfortable to this generation than it has been to anyone before. They create videos of all sorts of things. So those are tool sets and skill sets that they have and they have a feel for it. So I think that's a really cool way to let them kind of come to the table in their own way as well. So Mark, as we kind of wrap this thing up, I've got two quick questions for you and I'm looking for, okay. for quick answers. So if I'm a prospective student, and I'm trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up, why should I be a part of construction? I think construction gives you that creativity spark. Uh, it gives you a challenge. If you enjoy being around people uh, and technology, it's such a fun field to be in. I just love the fact that every day in construction is going to be a little different than the day before. Uh, and I think that's what our students enjoy about the process once they get out and get to be a practitioner. And, and I, feel, I feel like uh, I love construction because it applies to so many other areas in the world that if you learn construction and critical thinking that many times you are prepared for just about anything. Uh, so the, the other quick question is, if I'm an employer, if I'm a big GC, if I'm, if I'm a construction outfit looking to hire, why do I pick Purdue? Why, why should I go to Purdue first for my engineering and construction students? Yeah, I think it's because we are working on those other skill sets, right? We're, we're not, 
we're not teaching them calculations in a silo. We're not teaching them estimating in the silo. We're teaching them the way it would happen on a job site. So we're trying to give a student that when they come out the door, they're ready to run work. They're ready to be involved. They're not, okay, you came from Purdue, you have your degree. Now we have to train you for the next three or four years before you really become a, a producing employee. We're trying to get them to that point right at graduation and, and bind those skill sets together because that's what industry needs right now. Not, not four years from now, right now. Yeah. And I, I uh, think that my perspective on Purdue is that it is, it's what, one of the best things about the state of Indiana is Purdue. I think that uh, it's very no nonsense. I think that it's, I, I speak very folksy and I've kind of retained that even living in Seattle as long as we have, uh, but it's very no nonsense. It's very to the point. If you want a great education, then Purdue is the place to go for construction. Period. Yeah, and they, you know, it's right. It's, it's, we want you to put in the effort, right? Yeah. There's no substitute for putting in the work. And I think yeah. that Purdue does that across the board. Come here, put in the work, you will get a valuable education but we want the education to translate to a career. That's, I think that's the big emphasis is move that forward and use that as the stepping stone to go get started right away. Not, uh, I'm going to muddle through and, and maybe, maybe find some direction. We're going to help you get there a little quicker uh, if we can. Uh, and so that you feel confident. We all, when we feel confident, we perform better. And that's what we're looking for. And, Absolutely. and recently we've been reaching out to folks who are college grads uh, and, and folks who are just kind of coming out of Purdue, just saying, hey, if you need somebody to talk to, if you need an industry contact, if you want some insight or even help with your resume, uh, we've been just providing that level of support for folks just to, to try to push uh, the Purdue spirit. Um, are there any sites or, or web links that we could direct folks to if they want to learn more about your program? Yeah, so we're part of uh, the Polytechnic Institute at Purdue. Uh, the, it's former College of Technology. So if you go to Purdue University and then you look up PPI, uh, Purdue Polytechnic Institute, we're one of the departments uh, within the institute. Um, we've got uh, multiple videos. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll share it with you guys uh, here in the near future. We're going to be starting a, a YouTube channel uh, mm -hmm. that is meant for middle schools and high schools uh, to get some more construction videos, but uh, kind of a curated uh, set of videos with some uh, curriculum built into it. But we also, um, one of the first playlists we'll have is young professionals mm -hmm. that have gone out and worked for a couple of years and what do they like about it, what's challenging about it, in case you're thinking about construction. Um, We'll also have a, a series of uh, videos to watch from our interns as they've gone out and done an internship and come back. What did they learn about communication? What did they learn about leadership? What did they learn about conflict resolution? And you can watch those very short videos and get a flavor for what's going on. So that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. We'd be happy to share that with, with the, you and your team and, and your listeners. That'd yeah, we really appreciate that. That sounds like an excellent resource. Yeah, and we'd be uh, happy to put any of the provided links on the show notes for, for the podcast episode where folks can find it. Uh, so what else? I think that covers it. All right. Uh, sounds good to me. We've got to get back and get a, get a semester started here in a few days. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you being with us, Mark. Uh, thanks well, for taking thanks, the time. Thanks for the invite. And like I said, it's great to catch up with Purdue people uh, wherever they are all over the world. It's always fun to, to touch base. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> right. So, Mark, uh, we've been told by, by folks that we work with, industry professionals, that millennials don't feel empathy. What's your take on that? Uh, wow. I, I guess, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what we said. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, really? Okay. It's um, like, you do know they're still humans, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, and I, some, sometimes when I hear comments like, I'm like, do you know what the definition is? Do you, are we talking sympathy or empathy? Do you know the difference? Uh, yeah, it's funny. We get a lot of these, um, you know, oh, well, they, they, you know, millennials don't do this or, or this generation doesn't do that. And I'm like, what's your contact level then with that age group? Now, um, 
or, or have they been given the right opportunity? Maybe, maybe you just haven't had the right conversation. So I try not <laughs> to get caught up in that too much. Yep. Um, you know, I've got children that range in age from 18 to 23, uh, you know, teaching, I'm on job sites in a, in a day's basis. I think I'm around, you know, from say mid teens to, you know, mid seventies talking to my parents. So it, it's funny to hear one generation talk about another generation. It's yeah. so great. Yeah. It's well, great. and that is kind of a generational requirement that we have to throw shade at the generation that comes <laughs> after. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and and I, I think there's an interesting part about communication that, that, uh, people will say, and, and we talked about it in the podcast that, uh, that millennials don't communicate well. Um, but, really, I mean, they're kind of masters of communication. It's just that, that much of their communication looks drastically different from the communication that we grew up with. It's, it's video. It's presenting almost yeah. a personal brand via social media. Right. Our, our yeah. son has his own logo, right, at age 15. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I'd love to have my own logo. I'm not creative <laughs> enough to come up with one, so, so I what appreciate would, the skill set. Yeah. <laughs> so what does the Mark Zimfer logo look like? Is there, is there <laughs> yeah, like an animal that goes along with it? or? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, it, I don't know. At this point, some days when I get out of bed, you know, maybe it should be like a sloth or something because I'm moving so slow. Uh, you know, or you know, gr growing up in construction, it was a lot of gas station food. So maybe it's one of those nasty, you know, gray hot dogs that came out of the, the, the hamster wheel. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. Sure. The, the 50 cent hot dogs? Yeah, yeah right. Right. We, some of us grew up on those one way or the other. So uh, sorry, mom, if you're listening to this, I'm <laughs> talking about your cooking skills. Yeah. I appreciate that communication skill set because um, I think uh, I can, I can get long winded. Yeah. And you, you know, you guys probably heard that in the podcast sometimes, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cut uh, that out. Don't worry. <laughs> perfect. Good. That, that'll make me sound uh, more concise. But you, th you think about millennials and they can get a lot of information across in a very short time frame. You just have to understand the language. H how are they doing that? You know, how, and are you reading all the information that they're putting out or are you just reading it the way somebody like me, yeah. who's say 50 was taught to read. So I think it's, just appreciate each group. I mean, as we talked about this with trades, yeah. you can learn a lot from the trades. Well, you can learn a lot from millennials. You can learn a lot from this latest generation that they still haven't quite named yet. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's, they have thoughts, they have creativity, they have energy. I look at it as that's our job to get that out of them. You know, why should they have to always be the one pushing the envelope? Why can't we reach and try to take, take the hand instead of waiting for them to, to give you the hand kind of thing. Mm -hmm. well, and a, a superpower of humans is, is evolution and adaptation. And yeah. in millennials and the next generation, they're able to parse huge amounts of information and find the nuggets that are valuable much, much faster than, yeah. than older folks. So I think we all have superpowers. We all have the ability to learn from each other and, and millennials are no different. Yeah. Well, and you watch millennials in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. I watch people, you know, faculty, hey, you need to take part of your lecture online when you need to pre-record and they freeze in front of the camera. <laughs> you give a, a millennial a camera and they're like, hey, this is like, this is like sitting in my room. I can knock this yeah. out with no problem. And yeah. so it's fun to watch and to learn and, uh, you know, to, to say, hey, could you show me how you did that? I, I, I didn't know my phone could actually do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anytime I have a technology problem in class, I'm like, okay, somebody come up and figure this out for me because I, I, I just do it, you know, I keep hitting the on off button to try to reboot the computer. You know, that's what they taught us back in the 80s. And uh, it, it uh, doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. It's fun. I enjoy it. I can't wait to dig into your material and uh, so we can play some of this in class and uh, love to follow up with you guys in the future and in any format, just communicating with one another since we're, we're both uh, we're both pushing the same train down the tracks. Yep. So.